Hello everyone, it's Elena back for the Financial Planner Live podcast today and today I am joined by Nikki Pipping, Financial Planner for Collective Financial Planning and I was looking through the vouched for top rated advisors the other day and in the top 20 uh, in 2021 vouched for top rated financial advisors as well so congratulations on that. Thank you, yeah thanks very much. How are you doing today Nikki, well? Really good thank you, yeah really busy. Good, busy, busy. that's exactly what we like to hear. So I thought we'd start off, if you don't mind, by just introducing yourself, letting the audience know a little bit about what you do. Super, yeah. So my name's Nikki, as you said, and I'm a financial planner. I'm based in Milton Keynes. Uh, I live with my two teenage sons. Well, one, actually, one's at uni. You're not coming back for a couple of weeks. Um, And I've been in the industry for coming up seven, eight years now, trained as a financial advisor, having come through as a para planner. So I know all the admin and the analysis kind of things, which I think gives me really good grounding. Mm-hmm. Um, and I now work as a fully qualified financial planner for, as part of our practice and I specialise in helping women who have come through divorce and need a bit of help getting back on their feet financially. Yeah, so I'd say your LinkedIn bio reads, um, I help divorcees take back control of their financial futures. So obviously, you know, from the onset, when you find yourself on LinkedIn, you're now sort of personal, branded and marketed as someone that specialises in sort of divorcees and helping them plan their financial futures. Do you mind explaining yeah. a little bit about your personal circumstances and how it sort of got to that point? Yeah, it seems a little bit weird, doesn't it? It's a weird thing to sort of um, focus on, but um, obviously as a financial advisor, you can work with anyone from all walks of life. But I personally went through my own divorce um, and that was finalised last May. And even with all my own financial experience, um, I found the process exhausting and challenging and at sometimes just completely overwhelming. And I felt lonely throughout the whole process actually. And whilst everybody's used to finding a solicitor, um, they don't necessarily engage somebody to help them with their finances. So if I found it difficult, I just thought, my goodness, how do other people find their way through this system? And I just felt that if I could help other women in any way, share my experiences, share my um, yeah, my tips of getting through it, then that would be a good thing. That you yeah. know, that's literally what happened. And I seem to have magnetized other other women. It wasn't something I initially went out and looked for, but um, having had the experience as divorcees come through the practice door, they they come to me because I'm the one that can sort of pass the tissues and be the shoulder mm-hmm. to cry on and mm-hmm. and help from personal experience. You know, not just with the actual physical financial advice but also oh there's some forms that need filling in or oh don't forget you've got to get that bit of paper done it's it's more hand-holding than professional professional advice as you just said yourself you know this is an experience that you also went through personally you know you went through a divorce and you as a financial planner you know found it difficult to navigate around that space and you've got all the knowledge and all the training and all the backup behind you so you can only imagine what other women that are going through the same sort of experience without that knowledge behind them, the situations that they find themselves in. So what sort of issues may divorcee women face that is like very specific to their situation? Yeah, so I think um, once you've come out the other side of the divorce, you're just kind of, you're, you're on your knees, you're exhausted as I say, the process is traumatic. And then you then find yourself in a world like your, your, your future was mapped out before there were two of you and you had this this life plan, mm. possibly, mostly people do eventually. Um, and then you, you, your world has just split. You, you reach this fork in your life's plan and you, you end off on this tangent that you never planned for. So before you'd maybe plan to see out your days growing old with this person, you've got two pensions, you've got two state pensions, you've got your house and everything's ticking along. You know, there's never enough money for months, but at least, you've got a plan and there's two of you and all of a sudden like I say you've gone down this other tangent and you've got through this divorce and then you're faced with oh hang on a second um I've now only got one lot of pension statements coming through and I've got this whole mortgage all on my own shoulders and then the realization hits that I'm only going to get one state pension but I've still got to finance my life and there's just me (laughs) um and I think that it doesn't hit straight away but actually if you do engage someone like myself maybe to help out help sort out the pension sharing order then that's certainly something I'm going to raise fairly on in the process it's not just sorting out pension sharing order it's facing that financial future um and we're facing it head on not not hiding from it because you can't 
if you just ignore it or you're never gonna you know you're gonna find yourself working till 75 let's face that head on let's put things in place let's um yeah let's put some yeah. in place, I really. can imagine for lots of women and you touched on this before you touched on this previously you know you act like a bit of a shoulder to cry on you know you, you're there to hand the tissues it's the the emotional side of things as well yeah mm-hmm. I can imagine that you know when you're a divorcee woman and you've come out of all of this it is it's really overwhelming you know on the finance side and the personal side as well yeah and to add yeah to add to that quite often especially maybe slightly older women the the way the relationships often worked you know in the past has been that the man's handled all of the finances so you've got that that element as well so you come out the other side yeah you're emotional you're exhausted and now bills keep coming through the door or post comes through the door or pension statements you've never seen before because somebody else handled it for you and now you're on your own and who's going to help you do that you know and a lot of paperwork that comes through from financial companies we're so regulated there's a lot of information that needs to be in that paperwork but it it, it's baffling to to a lot of people so it's just yeah it's just being being another another pair of eyes another you know person to to be a soundboard to just just to help just to help and guide really because I think and I I can imagine the emotional side of things is, you know, just as important as the actual yeah. providing the financial planning advice. Do you find lots of women then that have come out of this, you know, divorce, it is actually the first time that they themselves have gone for financial advice. Maybe previously, as you said, their partners have done all the finances or they've actually gone to a financial planner, but with a partner. So they've not fully done everything themselves. Do you find that this is potentially for a, a, some of these people, you know, the first time they've really sat down and looked at financial planning themselves? Yeah. Hundred percent. Um, yeah, it's not everybody, but for a lot of people, it is their first experience of financial planning, and it's it's terrifying. And they don't even really realise what we do and what and what we need to do. So they'll have a, a document from the court that says you're awarded a, a portion of your ex-husband's pension, and then they go, "What do I do with that? What does that mean?" Yeah. And then they've got to find it. Then they've got to find a financial advisor, which actually um, in itself can be quite scary because how do they find one and mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and they don't mm-hmm. know what that's going to mean so you and I touched on this before on a, on a previous call it's about breaking down those those barriers about becoming more approachable and um you know I think people's image in their head is of um a very jargon filled quite a close-knit community they're made to maybe you know the power is imbalanced maybe they're made to feel stupid they don't want to feel stupid and ask silly questions and 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 maybe that's worse for women I I I tend to find that that's worse for women I know I felt like that when I was looking for lawyers you know Mm -hmm. god I don't want them to look down on me but I've got Mm -hmm. all these silly questions and it's finding someone that you can have a personal relationship with Mm -hmm. that you don't mind opening up and saying I don't really understand what this bit of paper means what does that mean and and that that's what's important for me what I'm trying to achieve with with my clients is is a relationship one where I'm approachable I'm empathetic and we spend time with me just just listening and just we compare notes in a way you know oh my god did that happen to you and and this happened and and uh, and and then we look at the finances because it's about building a relationship with someone so that you trust them enough to Mm -hmm. to even begin to understand Mm -hmm, the world mm -hmm, of finance mm -hmm. that's what that's how I feel yeah do you feel like going then obviously it's an experience that you've you've gone through yourself and now sort of moving forward you ended up as you just said when you didn't even necessarily mean to end up specializing in divorcee women but the way that it's manifested is 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 that is how it's panned out do you think that is due to the fact that obviously you have been through this experience yourself you having gone through a similar experience to other people allows them to open up and feel more comfortable yeah I think so and I think that's the same when I was looking for lawyers you know um I, I went for various meetings with various different lawyers, but the lady I went with was someone who had been there who could say, yeah, I've done this, I've been there. Because you, you're you looking for someone you can connect with, for someone who can give you first-hand experience. And if I hadn't have been through that process myself, I wouldn't necessarily know the pitfalls. I wouldn't know which forms need to be filled in or at what process you apply for this or press that button or or whatever. So at least having been through it, I might not know all the answers because everybody's process is slightly different and everyone's situation is different. Mm-hmm. But I certainly now can talk from a point of 
of experience and I've got the connections of other people that I can say well actually that didn't happen to me but I know this lady that it did and you know that's that's really important and I think that's what people are looking for isn't it yeah you know? it's with anything in life anything in life I think you want someone that you you can build rapport with and I know we spoke about this previously but financial planning and it's it's just it's such a barrier for women generally to access financial planning whether you're you're a divorcee woman whether you're a young woman whether you're a woman that's you know just starting to look at their finances or starting Mm -hmm. to think about their pension and stuff like that it is viewed as such an archaic industry you 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 view it as men in pinstripe suits that are going to try and sell you things and sort of coat it in technical jargon so I really appreciate that it's all about building those trusted relationships it's not just nowadays about selling you something it's all about actually building a really strong foundation to go along with it and we spoke about this previously you know financial planning then therefore being a good financial advisor is not just all about your technical knowledge or your product knowledge obviously that becomes such a good is is a big part of it but the soft skills are really crucial and I'm sure you and in, in your position and the people that you deal with the soft skill side of things is just important as having that really strong technical knowledge and knowing everything about sort of financial planning behind that yeah I, I almost feel like that's more important yeah because yeah I do because in order for in order for someone to trust you with their finances and let's be honest you know, when we're doing a fact find, when we're when we're building information for a client in order to come up with a recommendation, we literally need to know everything. Mm-hmm. You know, so that that person has to feel comfortable with with you as a person in order to be able to open up and put and share that information because it is everything. Yeah, <laughs> and and if you're not comfortable with that person that you're talking to you're going to hold back or or you're going to be nervous about about giving that information and I totally get it especially for people that are my age or older you know will remember the the pension scandals you know and all all the history that financial services has gone through and I I I wouldn't have joined financial services in in that era it 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 was a it was an odd era and it's, it's just been cleaned up so much the FCA is so strict mm-hmm. that I, I feel like we found as an industry we're finding our moral compass and that that is a strong part of who I am. I've got a really strong moral compass. I want to do what's right for people. I want to make a difference to their lives. And and now everything's more transparent. And it is we put the heart, you know, the heart of everything we do is is our client. And we make a commitment to see them once a year, minimum once a year we see them. And that's 100% right. Why was that never the case? Yeah. <laughs> how, how can you have sold somebody in the olden days? You'd have been sold a pension, wouldn't you? You'd been sold a pension at yeah. 22. You might never have sat down with a financial advisor again until you hit retirement at 65 or 66, 68, whatever it is now. Why, how many things change in your life? In that oh, period? so many. It's ridiculous. You know, who you were at 22 and what you were prepared to put your money into at 22 will not be the same as what you wanted at 50 or 60 or 30. Yeah. Life just changes. So for me, I came into the industry when when it was changing and when it was more about relationships. It's about going on that journey with that client. So for some people, you know, I've got clients who are 18. That's a long journey. They're going to outlive me. Um, and for others, they're, they're closer, you know, they're closer to the end of their journey. Um but you know for the divorcees we're sort of generally in the middle and they're my age-ish so we're working hand in hand and that's what I'm aiming for I'm aiming to to be their partner to hold their hand from this into the next phase of their life and from that point forward and for them to feel like they've got somebody they can trust that they can turn to then for all those little questions that come up when their husbands might have dealt with that in the past or there's this letter that's come through or you know, I'm taking my pension, I've got these forms, what do I fill in, you know, might be an NHS nurse, and you get, you get a stack of paperwork to yeah, fill in. Yeah, you know? yeah. And you just need somebody to, to sit and hold your hand and do that with. And that's, that's what I'm aiming for is that, you know, using, using the empathy, being there, being accountable, and being a partner, mm-hmm. moving, moving forwards. And that's really critical. Yeah, really critical. And, you know, I, I, I do agree. I think the, the soft, uh, it's, as we just touched on then financial planning is no longer and holistic financial planning especially is no longer all about sales or just generally about assets under management it's about planning for your children to go to university when are you going to buy your first house or planning for your dream holidays it's everything all encompassing so I fully appreciate you know why you've got to sit there and, and build those strong relationships with these individuals and obviously for someone like yourself when you've gone through the divorce working with divorcee women 
it's you can build those really strong trusted relationships built on empathy because you fully understand or appreciate at least if you don't fully understand what the other individual is going um, going through no everyone's different and you know loads of people generally are especially within financial planning and also working with Recruit UK alongside being in the Financial Planner Live podcast, lots of people are always really hungry to chase those high net worth clients. And we spoke about this before. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with going after those high net worth individuals, but someone like yourself has proven that you can really sort of take advantage and monopolize as such on your experiences to help other people. Would you recommend that other people do this or have a think about how they can really add value to their clients? Yeah, adding adding value is re- is critical. And if you were to um, go onto LinkedIn or Google financial advisors, there I mean, there's not that many of us. I think there's something like twenty five thousand. Don't know if you know the figures, but it's not it's not massive. There's not enough financial advisors for for people in the in the country. But if you just search for financial advisors, it's a bit like if you search for I don't know driving instructor, you just get a list of names. How do you how do you pick one of those? How do you narrow that down to the person that you are going to trust to look after your money or you're going to trust your 17 year old child to learn to drive or whatever it might be? So finding something that you're good at or that you're specialized in or that you're interested in or you feel you can help helps that client find you you know and I took advice on this from some cleverer people than me who were the ones that said you know, you need to find a niche and I'd found it I just hadn't really vocalized it if you like and actually they're right because now when somebody's looking for a financial advisor who because they've got a pension sharing order or they're going through divorce you know I'm going to pop up I wouldn't pop up if somebody is looking to save for a holiday necessarily but somebody else might or and I don't do mortgages so I'm not going to pop up if they're looking for mortgages but this is my passion this is my mission this is this is what um, drives me so that's great we're, we're marrying the two needs aren't we or the two types of mm-hmm. people if you like so I guess it's not only helping the well it's not only helping me but it's helping the client and I, and I guess that's what I'm trying to say so if if any other financial advisor there has a passion or, or they can at least identify what it is they're doing or they identify the clients they want to help that's helping that client find them too mm-hmm, so you mm-hmm. you have you're cutting down the time that it takes for that person to find the person they want to work with I think yeah. that's maybe it is a hundred percent and I fully understand you know you type in financial advisors Bristol where we're based you will literally get a list and if you're looking for financial planning how do you actually know who is yeah. gonna work best with you or who you're going to sit down with and be able to build that relationship and who's going to build that empathy and you know you touched on that the relationship building side of things is just important and you Mm. really want to be adding value and I guess that's where for yourself being able to sit there as you touched on with someone with a box of tissues being able to let them actually have someone to a shoulder to cry on maybe they've not even spoken to someone else themselves that is divorced or has gone through that whole experience so I can imagine that emotional side of things Mm. is literally just as important as the 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 financial planning process side and that Mm. for an individual like divorcee women they are looking for someone that they really can open up to and open on all levels and there's nothing saying that there's not the, the place for the male financial advisor in this sphere, but you're not going to get that same relationship as a divorcee woman if you go to the generic, what is 75% of financial advisors that is sort of male and over the age of 50. Potentially not. No, potentially not. I think uh, intrinsically women and men approach things differently. Um, and we we do tend to connect as women on a more emotional level um and you know even if we let's just say we all go down the pub generally I'm being stereotypical here but generally the men are not going to be talking about their emotions are they they're going to be talking about football or what's gone on in the world you know what's gone on at work or whatever like when I was married I'd, my husband might have gone to the pub and I'd come back and I say oh so and so had their baby yet or is is this person done this and he'll go oh I didn't know they were pregnant they would not have talked about all of that whereas women that's the first thing we're going to talk about, isn't it? We're going to talk about what's going on in their lives, how they're feeling about X, Y, Z, their mum's ill or the kids, I don't know, had trouble at school. We're going to know all that. We're going to know all that nitty gritty. And that's what connects us as, as women. Mm-hmm. We're quite, we, we, but that, that's, I guess that's biology, isn't it? Yeah. So, and I think for me, even without niching down and, and moving into this particular field, even before that, when I first started, and I 
try to work out how I was going to be and finding my way in the world as an advisor, I quickly learned that for me, it's about the relationships. It's mm-hmm. about allowing enough time mm-hmm. so that you can have a cup of tea, you can have a chat, you get to know as people and as women. And if you if you don't have that part of the experience for a woman client, well, I think they're not going to engage with you. They're not going to feel comfortable enough to open up about their finances and their world and their dreams because we need that emotional connection first. Mm-hmm, Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Yeah, no, fully. No, and I, I fully, I completely agree. And I do think, you know, we, we said, touched on this previously, that if I was going to go, for example, I'm 22, you know, if I, my dad's a financial advisor, so dad gets uh, the, the pleasure of dealing with me. But, you know, I'd go for someone that related with, with my issues someone that understands someone that I felt like I could be open with and maybe say things that are slightly more silly or you know sound a bit you know stupid in your head but you don't mind opening up because you really trust and engage with that person and I feel like what you've just touched on then about how women generally you know you get us all into the pub we all want to talk about our feelings you know I was it's funny you said about boys I was like the first thing they want to talk about is football and we are being you know stereotypical very stereotypical but, but yeah I do think the the characteristics of um, many females and what are stereotypically female characteristics in regards to the empathy, the being good listeners, being slightly more intuitive are really good characteristics for a financial planner. Do you not agree? Yeah, I think so. I think they're essential. Yeah. Yeah, If I'm really honest, I think they're essential because if you're not listening, you're not hearing what is important to that person and yes you can sort out a pension you can sort out an ISA but why are they doing those things what's important to them what's the goal that they're trying to get to you know you it's about dreaming it's about envisaging that future it's about is that for their children is that for them going to uni like you said or or is it their retirement is it planning a legacy there's always a why behind all of these things and you know if you're trying to explain to somebody that they need to start saving a little bit more into their pension that if you if you haven't worked out why they're doing it or they haven't told you why they're doing it they're just going to see that as another cost on a monthly basis coming out of their pot of money which is always stretched but if if you know if if they're thinking right well I want to be able to retire early because I want to be able to spend time with my grandchildren or I I want to travel we've always promised we're going to do this trip and then you can envisage that and you understand their why right well if we up our contributions to x we can shave this many years off you can get on that trip or Mm -hmm. whatever right okay now you've got buy-in now you're all connected and you're all focused on those goals otherwise it's just it's a pension it's yeah. boring it's black and white it's just one of those things I've got to do and then you don't pay in and then you're going to miss that goal and you're not going to achieve the dreams that you've worked so hard for all because nobody really broke it down or helped you envisage that and and plan for it yeah. so it's, it's, it's critical critical to think to to hear to listen and to hear mm-hmm, what, mm-hmm, what people mm-hmm, are saying mm-hmm. um, and without those skills I, I I just think you're missing you're missing yeah. what's important to everybody. 100%. So do you think like for for people that may what um women that are watching this, may that be that they're in sort of back office roles at the moment, or whether that may be that they're not even currently in the industry and are interested in financial planning. Do you think if you've got that skill set, you are, as we just touched on, you can hear and listen, you're empathetic. Do you think, you know, those are the kind of people that we need to be transitioning into the industry? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And when I think females are massively underrepresented in financial services, I don't know the figures, you probably know more when you're you're recruiting them. Mm -hmm. But I know certainly when I joined a few years back, I'd go to a conference, there's not very many, not very many ladies in the room, (laughs) not very many women in the room, it's mainly men. Um, It is changing. And actually, when I see, we obviously haven't had face to face conferences for the last little while. But uh, the last ones that I'd have gone to there were a lot younger people coming through which is great there's a lot more training going on a lot more recruitment within the industry to bring graduates in which is great because then you're getting people who are younger who are passionate who are interested in it but to get more women in board I think if you think you know 50% of the population is female 50% is male and if what we're seeing is that females want to interact with a female financial advisor then by definition we need more female financial advisors don't we otherwise 
they're not there to serve yeah. the needs of, of that clientele yeah you know? and and like and we need younger people as well because like you say if you're 22 I mean you might not necessarily want an advisor who's 22 you might want somebody with a bit of bit more experience I don't know but you certainly I imagine would want somebody who's who's not 70 you're going to want somebody who remembers at least remembers what it's like to be young who maybe has a benefit of a few more years ahead of you so they can go oh yeah I, I know what it was like when I was saving for a house and I had to make these sacrifices and this is how I did it or whatever but you want people that that are like you we we interact with people who are like us that's that's who we connect with so yeah we need younger people we need better diversity in the industry that's that's a given I think uh, I think yeah, it's coming I, I think it's I, coming I completely agree I think it is female financial advisors are outnumbered by their male counterparts at 10 to 1 so no way it's quite an astounding figure so things are obviously still yeah getting a lot better in the industry but I completely agree you know as we've just touched on your whole market is based now on divorcee women people that have gone through that experience people that you relate to and the, the world is changing in the sense that women are holding more wealth generally in terms of like there's more, a higher percentage of women millionaires. Generally, you know, the whole gender paradigms are changing in regards to women taking control of their finances a lot earlier, especially like the new generation coming up, you know, definitely myself and my friends, there's such an emphasis for us to look after our finances and not place it on partners or anything to look after how on earth can you unlock that market if you don't have the female financial planner representation that can connect with it so do you feel yeah. like there should be more emphasis on firms to look at not just the gender profiles that we're talking about here but as we just touched on the age profiles of their mm -hmm. financial planners yeah and I think it's coming I know our network um have developed a good academy to train you know graduates um to, to bring on younger people I mean we haven't really touched on this side but if you think if the if the age of the financial planners in general is is much older they're all retiring mm -hmm. we need a we've got succession planning issues here as well what do we yeah. do with all the clients that those guys are looking after because they're not all going to be the same age so it's about planning which we should be good at but planning also you know for, for younger people to come into the practice so that then you've got that continuity for the clients and I do always say to my clients you know what I'll ask I always say have you got any other questions obviously but one question not all of them ask is well what happens if I fall under a bus or you know I I, I die or obviously if I'm older than them what happens when I retire or, or I die before them and it is all about succession planning isn't it and making sure you've got young blood coming through it's something we're really good at collective financial planning actually my boss is brilliant and we've we've I'm I'm definitely not the youngest there are several people younger than me in the practice and we've got new graduates on the team he's always looking to bring on young blood new ideas and we'll mentor those those guys through um the power planners on to, on to becoming advisors so that they've got those skills technical skills and analytical skills as well as the people skills and open work are really good at training training those through the diploma and out the other side so and it's really important i'm sure all the other networks are doing something similar because yeah you need the skills and you need yeah, that training yeah and the opportunity you need a firm that's willing to help you do that don't you it sounds like collective financial planning really are, um are shining the beacon forward because especially as working on the recruitment side of things i deal with lots of candidates that really you know just because they're a younger age profile you know they've been power planners for a couple of years they've got really good technical knowledge they've got their level four a lot of them are even creeping up onto chartered status and they've wow. So they're literally battering down the door trying to find a trainee financial planning opportunity or a wealth management right. firm that will look at them, you know, under the age of 30. They find it really, really difficult. And the, the yeah. feedback they often get is, well, you know, we can't put you in front of our clients or our clients aren't going to be receptive to, to someone of that age. So do you think that's a bit of a counterproductive thought? Yeah, I do. I do, because that's very short sighted, because actually people people your age need financial advice the mm -hmm. same as people my age and if you haven't got people in your practice that are younger that can empathize with younger people I mean I, I get it I guess somebody who's 70 75 might find it a little bit difficult but I, I've got clients all the way up to age 80 88 89 you know I can still empathize with mm -hmm. them I had my, my parents aren't with me anymore but obviously I had elderly parents and you've just got to find a way to empathize with with the people on their journeys haven't you but 
yeah, no, I, I, I'm baffled as to why the opportunities aren't there unless we just, there's just not enough financial planning firms in general. I mean, there aren't enough advisors mm -hmm. in the country. So maybe it's, you know, maybe it's just, there's just yeah. not enough opportunities there anyway for anybody. No. It's probably a question of us all setting up on our own. <laughs> new practices, new businesses springing up, don't yeah, we? Yeah, but I think, you know, and you just touched on then like succession planning and the whole question, well, yeah. what gonna happen if I fall under a bus tomorrow or the worst yeah. you think about it but I also think you know from my perspective it's something really comforting about being able to work with a financial advisor who you know could potentially be there to work with your children or maybe your yeah. grandchildren and really they important. do trust and build this amazing relationship with this person because they become you know you can help people with their finances their fi financial plan and future it's such an important and crucial element money's one of the most important things to sort of everyone i think it's really comforting and nice knowing that i can build a, an excellent relationship with someone and then i can then pass that relationship on to my children and i know they're going to be really look well looked after and their finances are going to be really well looked after the same way that yeah. i found, found a financial advisor that really looks after me yeah, absolutely. And I, that's already happened for me because I'm already looking after the children of some of some of my clients, oh. you know, young children, you know, like 18, 19. But, and also, you know, I've had older clients and, you know, now I'm looking after, and the other way because I've got clients who are my age and I'm now looking after their parents. So we're on to their parents. So, yeah, and that's a simple, I guess, at least if you've built a solid relationship with your client and they trust you. If they're willing to refer you either to friends or their children or parents or members of the family, you've done a good job there, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Because for you to personally recommend someone else reflects on your integrity. So if I refer somebody to an accountant and that accountant's rubbish, that's going to fall back on me, isn't it? So if somebody's willing to recommend me to someone else, that means they they trust me which is a huge responsibility, but a huge honour as well. So, if, yeah, and that's, that does happen to us. Our business is built on referrals. So, um, yeah, that, that does happen. But it's important, I think it's important for the clients to, like you say, to know that we will be there. So when we, we always hope for the best, but plan for the worst. So we spend a lot of time looking at protection and will writing and, and all of those financial planning basics. But they're there in place so that if the worst happens to that client, their children, their dependents, or the people that they love are looked after. And for them to know that that's there and that, yes, they'll inherit their pension or yes, we've sorted out their will, but not only that, we're there to hold their hands and help them through that process as well. They know that they can pick up the phone and say, oh, gosh, mum sadly passed away. What do I do with the pension? Great, you can look after it, super. You know, that's that's what it's all about, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's about creating a relationship and, and building trust for, for, for the whole family. Yeah, and as we just said that, the whole, this whole conversation really is centered around that importance of those building those relationships and how yeah. using your own personal experiences and firms being proactive in having lots of different people that have gone through different experiences and are of different genders or and ethnicities as well and Definitely. age profiles to really connect with all clients and you know Definitely. from a firm's point of view it's going to make you more profitable isn't it because it's going to allow you to unlock more markets than you probably would yeah. if you had five financial advisors that are all you know white british male over the age of 60 yeah definitely yeah you increase your reach that way yeah again we're quite we're quite eth ethnically broad which must uh, which must help because some sectors of the community will only speak to you know their own culture i guess you know and cultures are different different cultures treat money differently mm -hmm. As the typical white British person, we're pretty rubbish at saving, generally. <laughs> um, and then there's other areas that really believe in houses. You know, they're not interested in pensions. They just want houses. But then, fine, we can sort out buy to let mortgages. We can sort out that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's about having the right people in place to meet the needs of, of all those different clients and matching the personalities so that you're putting the right person in place for that yeah. relationship. 100% and those strong relationships then sort of boil down from the fact that you have someone that you can relate to as we've touched on you know you've got someone that you can build that trust with and understands what you're going through to, to some degree or another and we opened yeah. up Oh, well, I opened up the podcast by showing sort of what your LinkedIn bio reads and yeah. as you, said, you know when you type in a financial planner and, and you, you get them all up you're trying to find someone that you relate with and you specialize with so from the onset when you land onto your LinkedIn profile 
you can see that that is what you specialize in. And we spoke about that you have been using LinkedIn a lot more proactively recently. What was the reason for this? There's so many different reasons why people use LinkedIn, but what made you sort of start honing, honing in on it? That was a really kind way of saying you're really rubbish at LinkedIn. Oh, no. You've only jumped on things. No, it? not at all. You've just been <laughs> so, cropping up no, on my I feed don't. all the time at the moment. So you're obviously doing something very well now more than anything else. Well, I, I, I was non-existent about eight months ago. <laughs> so I hid from LinkedIn for many, many, many months. Too frightened of it. Wasn't, wasn't my bag. And I, um, over Christmas, decided I really needed to do something because you know, COVID had hit and there's no networking events and all of that kind of stuff. And I thought, right, you know, seize the opportunities or whatever. So I chose LinkedIn because it's professional um, and then sought professional help from people who know their stuff because you don't know what you don't know. And mm -hmm. I don't know about social media. So I found the people that do. And um, I jumped on primarily, my main goal really, if I'm honest, was to find other professional connections because as I was working with um, divorcees, I'll get, oh, well, do you know a solicitor? Or actually, I need to sort my will out. So do you know a will writer? Or I've got other clients who may be business owners. Well, do you know an accountant because mine's just retired or mm -hmm. whatever? So it's about building a wider circle of professional connections. And whilst I have some locally, um, I wanted, in a similar way to what we were just saying, I wanted to have a wider network of those people so that I could match the personality of that accountant or will writer with, the client because that all of my clients are different and what works for you know a high earning businessman might not work for a stay-at-home working mm -hmm. stay-at-home mum who's got a little side hustle sort of thing so I wanted to expand my connections that's why I came on at that point it was not about me and my profile it was just about reaching out and finding connections and it just it mushroomed from there really once I found the right help to set up my profile properly and uh, I found a group of like-minded sort of um I can't think of the word savvy professional yeah. women maybe um then yeah I've got a really great tribe of women and I've um we share really good ideas and and then I've slowly become a little bit braver and then <laughs> on. I'm not quite as scared my first sort of posts were type the post press it with send <laughs> run away and hide <laughs> and now I'm like oh I'll do it anyway it's yeah fine. well fine. you come up on my feed a lot more a lot of those Nicky well, that's how we got in contact I was seeing your, your posts on my LinkedIn in regards to sort of your specialisms and I was thinking how unique and interesting that was so do you think and this is the power of LinkedIn does it allow you you feel like to add value to other people the same way that you can take value from it yeah, and like I say, I think at the beginning, that's not really what I was thinking about. But what I realised was, you know, in a way, this is sort of a, a mission of empowering women to take control of their finances. I know I'm aiming for divorcees, but it's not just divorcees that mm -hmm. come to me. And it's about breaking down barriers, breaking down conceptions that people have, misconceptions really, about financial services and and being able to put information out there and I've got zillions of ideas I haven't had time to do but even basic things about people don't know what age they can retire at even if you can put simple bits of information out there it it helps somebody to start to plan doesn't it so I've done little polls and I've done bits of information and I've got um like uh, five steps to help you start thinking about retirement or seven steps to sort out your money after divorce, those kind of stuff. And if I can get bits of information out there for people, which means actually if they're too frightened to contact anybody, they've at least got to start, haven't they? You know, they've got a bit of information they can make a start with. Um, then that's that's a good thing. So I'm still starting on the financial education there, aren't I? And getting a yeah. bit of understanding as well as breaking down those barriers because now they can see that I'm a real person and I'm I'm not sat in an office somewhere just behind a computer you know I'm a person and I've got two kids and my life's crazy like everybody else's <laughs> and, and also you know they can see I'm a woman and and uh and maybe that's what they're looking for so yeah, yeah it's, it's it's all about visibility and yeah breaking down barriers creating that trust in a in a in a slow growing kind of way yeah you know, get them I to know me get them words. to like me visibility breaking down barriers yeah I've, I really like those two words a sort of description of it from like I guess 
you didn't mean for it to mushroom into this, but it has. Has it helped more? And this, you just touched on visibility and breaking down barriers. Has it allowed you think more women to contact you? Have you seen an increase of women contacting you um, via LinkedIn, sort of wanting your your advice? Yeah, definitely, definitely. I've I've made I've had connections with people that I would never have met without doing this, because before I was you know locally based and um, we don't need to be with the power of of all this digital connection now thanks to covid in a way you know i've met people in yorkshire and devon and i don't know southampton and and where's that place suffolk you know all over the place it doesn't really matter where i am i mean it's much nicer to be able to sit down with a cup Mm -hmm. of tea and a slice of cake but it's not always possible and at least if we can meet over you know do a virtual cuppa they've been brilliant at just there's no pressure just come along see see if i can help and 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 we'll take it from there so yeah definitely I've reached people I wouldn't have reached before um not everybody's become clients but I feel like at least I've helped somebody along a step a step along their journey and it might be that I've signposted them to a divorce coach or to go back to their employer and ask a question or Mm -hmm. whatever it might be but that's just as important isn't it because they haven't wasted money or my time and I've not wasted theirs and that's that's just as important you're filtering yeah filtering out what could be potentially loads of non-starters but I've helped those people to go to the right places and you never know sometimes that might be enough for them or they might go great well you can actually help me but I've got this friend and they're going through this and could you help them so that's excellent and it's all that's the um LinkedIn is such a powerful tool you can add so much value and I think I've had discussion with other people on the podcast about this but it's all about you know giving and receiving and it's an excellent platform for that and I'd like to thank you Nikki for spending the time to speak to me this afternoon as part of the financial Planner podcast it's been an absolute pleasure to hear about your experiences and you discuss how financial planners can sort of work build on their experience to build those really trusted relationships have discussions about why The relationship building side is just important, if not even more than the knowledge side of things and, you know, the ever going conversation of how we can and why it's important to have gender diversity, age diversity and um, ethnic diversity within the industry. So thank you very much for joining me this afternoon, Nikki. Uh, Thank you, Elena. It's been great.